Tonight, the latest on Donald Trump's cabinet picks, an update on the worsening conditions in North Dakota as protesters dig in, and an exclusive interview on the upcoming constitutional referendum in Italy. This is Talking Points. Welcome to the December 1st edition of Talking Points. I'm your host, Alex Amico. We begin tonight with the latest picks for President-elect Donald Trump's cabinet. Most recently, he chose former Goldman Sachs CEO Steve Mnuchin as his Treasury Secretary. However, an effort led by Green Party candidate Jill Stein has raised the money for a recount in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Here to break down the President-elect's wild week are Talking Points election correspondent Dan Prager and contributor Galat Malamed. Guys, thank you for joining me. So us. let's start about talking about this recount. Uh, is there any merit to it and is there any chance it could change anything? Realistically, there's no chance it would change anything because in order for Hillary Clinton to win the Electoral College, every single state would have to flip. And there's about 107,000 votes combined between those three states that she's behind in. And she is relatively close in Michigan and somewhat close in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, it's a bit further. But one of the things really to look at is that there's not really any evidence of anything that would really swing anything in Hillary Clinton's favor. Right. Interestingly enough, though, Donald Trump is one of the people saying that there was this widespread voter fraud, but he's mm -hmm. saying it helped him. But he's kind of pushing more for this recount. He doesn't want it to happen to be saying, oh, there's voter fraud, we should check it out, which is a little strange. Right, but now turning to this to the transition for the upcoming Trump administration, Secretary of State, obviously one of the most important cabinet positions there is. Uh, right now, some of the top candidates have been uh, General David Petraeus, Mitt Romney, and Rudy Giuliani, all of which would sort of signal different directions that the, that the cabinet yeah, would be sure. moving in. Definitely. And, um, and one of the things is that with Mitt Romney, it sort of seems almost as though the president-elect staff is sort of boxing him out on this. Would you say that's right? Yeah, they really don't like Romney it's because Romney was one of the most ardent critics of Trump during the primary and the general election. Romney and Romney signals kind of a past for the Republican Party, a more moderate part, whereas mm -hmm. Trump is this new, more populist part of the Republican Party. And yeah. in a way, he's trying to reach out to Republicans if he were to pick Romney. He's trying to reach out to more moderate, more um, 2012 Republicans in doing that. But a lot of his supporters don't want that to happen. They want him to pick Rudy. Yeah, and Kellyanne is on the same page with those supporters. We have a clip of her, actually, of how she feels about this Romney possible pick. Uh, Governor Romney in the last four years, I mean, has he been around the globe doing something uh, on behalf of the United States of which we're unaware? I'm all for party unity, but I'm not sure that we have to pay for that with the Secretary of State position. But again, let me repeat, what Donald Trump decides, Kellyanne Conway and everybody else will respect. An another thing really is that um, Romney would be easily confirmed. Democrats would like him because he's a more moderate pick. Giuliani would kind of have a tougher time doing Rand that. Rand Paul's yeah. already said that he wouldn't support him, and Trump yeah. has a pretty slim Republican majority in the Senate right now. Yeah. And then with General Petraeus, I mean, mm -hmm. that's, uh, he obviously, his um, mishandling of classified right. information, Trump ran his campaign basically saying, mm -hmm. look at what Hillary Clinton did with classified information, lock her up, but and now, now possible Secretary I of State is. I, I want to look at some of the other cabinet picks in a minute. Uh, he announced uh, Mewchin for Treasury Secretary, Goldman Sa former Goldman Sachs banker. He announced um, Tom Price for Secretary of Health and Human Services. He's been in Washington for quite a while. Um, Trump ran on this, uh, and, and the possibility that Mitt Romney could be picked. Yeah. Trump ran on this, on this concept of drain the swamp, shake up Washington. Uh, by picking a Wall, St Wall Street banker and some other Washington insiders, is he sort of going back on that promise a little bit? He, I, he definitely is, I mean, especially the fact that he was one of the heads of Goldman Sachs. And again, this is what he criticized Hillary Clinton so much for, being too cozy with Wall Street. And um, he actually, Munchen actually donated to campaigns of Gore and Kerry when they were running for president. And believe it or not, Obama and Clinton, when they were running their senatorial campaigns, he donated to them. and. Now he's picking Although I will cabinet. say, mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to get into government without having experts, without yeah, having you need, those you members need, you need of the someone, swamp. You need to have someone to offset. Although his it. supporters probably are feeling a little bit betrayed for having a Goldman Sachs CEO. That's kind right. of the pinnacle of swampiness. Right. Of, like, well, we'll, we'll, see how the we'll see how the rest of the cabinet shakes out. Guys, thank you for joining me.
Coming up next, protests in North Dakota continue to grow. We will have the latest. Are your children in the right car seat for their age and size? It may be too late to check when you're on the road. Fortunately, you're on the couch. Don't think you know. Know you know. So, same time next week? Well, of course. We're gonna go out there in the rain. You're gonna get wet. All right, here we go. Oh, 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 This afternoon, members of the Syracuse community gathered in Perseverance Park in downtown Syracuse to encourage people to close their accounts with Chase Bank. The activists called the event an act of solidarity with the people of Standing Rock. Chase Bank is one of many that funds the Dakota Access Pipeline. Our own Jamie Weiss was on the scene earlier today. Alex, I'm here in Perseverance Park where members of the Syracuse community have been standing in solidarity with Standing Rock. The people you see behind me at that tent have been handing out flyers like these ones, urging people who are customers of the big banks, like Chase Bank right here, to close out their accounts in order to defund the Dakota Access Pipeline. According to the volunteers here, they've been telling me that big banks like Chase Bank, Bank of America, PNC, and Citibank, just to name a few, are some of the banks that are funding the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline. By closing out those accounts, they are hoping that it'll make a difference, even though we're a thousand miles away from Standing Rock. Once again, I'm Jamie Weiss in downtown Syracuse, Central City News. Thanks, Jamie. Tensions are escalating between protesters and authorities over the Dakota Access Pipeline. Over the weekend, the Army Corps of Engineers and the North Dakota governor ordered protesters to leave their camps by December 5th or face arrest. But demonstrators say they aren't going anywhere. Thousands of protesters and members of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe have been camped out along the Cannonball River in North Dakota since early this summer. More than 500 people have been arrested in total. Here with more on the rising conflict is national correspondent Sarah Nevin. Sarah, thank you for joining me. So we've been following this all semester. There have been different spikes of violence. There have been different escalations in the protests. But the protesters have never been forced to actually leave. Why is that? Yeah, so the main reason is safety. If you look at the video, winter has hit North Dakota. Demonstrators are living in the middle of a snowstorm in makeshift tents. So law enforcement says that anyone who stays does so at their own risk. However, they are taking uh, precaution. They're saying they're going to start blocking people and supplies from getting into the campsite. And people who do stay could face arrest for trespassing. So that doesn't really give protesters a lot of options for staying. So with this, this winter weather coming in, it's not just winter, it's winter in North Dakota on the plains. It's right. a harsh winter. They're still staying. What is, what's driving this determination among the protesters? I mean, they've been there for five, six months now, and they really have national attention now, and they don't want to get rid of that. And since the beginning, they've really been sending the same message. They feel their wa main water source is at risk, and so is their well-being. We have a clip from one of the Standing Rock members, Chasing Iron Eyes, speaking about this issue. Water is sacred, but it's also good business to protect your water resource. If they would have rerouted the pipeline or went with their original route north of Bismarck, we wouldn't even be in this fight right now. So, Alex, in early summer, there are only a few hundred people protesting. Now there's nearly 10,000, so they really are in for the long haul. And this new order about um, if they stay, they could be arrested for trespassing. In response, a couple thousand veterans have said that they're going to go to join the protesters. What's going on with that? Right, so that's an effort created on Facebook by a former vet called Veterans Stand for Standing Rock. And so 
uh, signups were capped at 2,000, but about 2,000 veterans are going to go to the campsite and act as a human shield between protesters and police from December 4th to December 7th. And like you said, it's really just a, an act of not of solidarity motivated by the increase in violence. Well, it certainly seems like this issue isn't going away anytime soon. Sarah Nevin, thank you for joining us. In the weeks before President-elect Trump takes office, President Obama is in a mad dash to save public lands. Here to tell us more about what's going on and why it's important to the nation is Talking Points political correspondent Josh Carney. Josh, thank you for joining us. Thanks, so let's talk about the why. Why is President Obama making this move to protect more public lands? President Obama is trying in many ways to preserve his climate legacy and that also of the United States. He's trying to preserve lands that are endangered of being exploited for oil and natural gas and even gold mining resources and also lands that are in very sensitive areas like the Arctic Ocean and drilling offshore in Alaska. He suspended so many claims for businesses, and he's actually been one of the most fundamental presidents in terms of saving public land. So it's the last two months of the Obama presidency. Uh, we have a new president who's been elected. This is legacy time for administrations. What does right. this say about the Obama administration's climate legacy? Barack Obama said that one of the biggest threats to the future of our climate is Donald Trump and his administration. He does not necessarily have the temperament, but he also doesn't have the correct policies in the viewpoint of that administration. So when Obama is trying to take his last stance that he can through his executive power, he is doing the little things in terms of preserving land and canceling uh, certain uh, limitations in terms of being able to mine for gold, mine for oil, mine for gas, offshore and inland. He's trying his best to preserve the natural resources of the country, which is something that he can have a true effect on. So what's the tangible benefit and what's the tangible effect that comes from these midnight regulations, these midnight rules that he's rolling out about public lands. Right. The regulatory principles that he's instating largely affect uh, the offshore of Alaska as well as over 265,000 acres of land in the main, uh, the main 48 states of the United States. So when you look at ac the actual impact that he will have in the long term, he's saving them from being exploited for natural resources, something that the Trump administration and the prospective people running for the United States interior position are formally against. So it's pretty prevalent that the Obama administration makes something happen in terms of preserving the climatology of our landscape. Right, and one of the, one of the top candidates that's been rumored for the Secretary of the Interior is, of course, former Vice mm -hmm. Presidential Candidate and Alaska Governor Sarah Palin, who right. is no great, uh, no great fan of uh, right. people wanting to combat climate Her, change. Her, coupled with the Governor of Oklahoma, are both mm -hmm. passionate advocates for fossil fuel investment, which is something that Trump also aligns himself with. Obviously, on the opposite side of the coin, the Obama administration has a very different view. All right, Josh Carney, thank you for joining Thanks us. Thanks for having me. When we come back, Italy is just three days away from voting on a constitutional referendum. We have an exclusive interview with Dr. Glenn Morgan. Stay with us. I see you mobbing over her. Let's go. Let's mob. Let's crawl. Mm -hmm. Let's crawl. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's crawl. Mm -hmm. Hey, yo, we mobbing. Come on, girl. Let's crawl. Mm -hmm. Hey, yo, let's crawl. Hey, yo, let's crawl. Hey, let's crawl. Hey, yo, let's crawl. Boom. You've messed up your son's haircut. Mom? Mm -hmm. Do you A, try to fix it? Like it never happened. B, work with what you got. Or C, show solidarity. Thank you, baby. As a parent, there are no perfect answers. But you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. This upcoming Sunday, the people of Italy will vote on a referendum to make changes to their constitution. If passed, the referendum will shrink the size of their Senate by more than 200 seats. Prime Minister Matteo Renzi has previously vowed to step down if the referendum does not pass. With Italy's political future in the balance, I sat down earlier with the director of the Moynihan Center for European Studies, Dr. Glenn Morgan, to break it all down. Professor, thank you for joining us today. Um, first question is about the referendum. If it, were to, if it is to pass, how will it change the Italian government? The referendum of December the 4th will change the Italian political system in three ways. At the moment, the Italian political system 
is unique in that it gives power to both the upper house and the lower house in equal measure. Both houses can introduce legislation and no law will pass until both houses approve it. Mm -hmm. So it is a system that's set up to weaken the governmental party. The referendum will increase the power of the party that wins the election in three ways. One, it will shrink the Senate, which at the moment is an unwieldy 315 mm -hmm. senators, down to 100. Second, it will increase the ability of the government to enact legislation by changing the electoral system. So when a party wins 40% of the vote, it will get 55% of the seats. And thirdly, it will change the balance of power between the central government and the local government. It will give a lot more power to the central government. In short, this referendum is designed to increase centralization in Italy and give more power to the party that wins the election. And so similar to when we were coming up to Brexit in the United Kingdom, when David Cameron said if it were to pass, he would likely step down. Uh, the Prime Minister of Italy, Renzi, has said he will step down if the referendum loses. Who's next in line for Italy if that were to happen? Well, I think there are two scenarios. Uh, he will resign, and on one scenario, the President of Italy will go to him and say, the country needs you, please stay. Mm -hmm. And he will go to the people and say, I wanted to resign, but the President has asked me to stay. I think that's less likely than the second scenario. The second scenario is the president of the country will choose someone from within his party, probably the economics minister, Padoan, and ask him to step in and become prime minister. An unstable year or so Absolutely. for liberal Western democracy. We, we had the Brexit vote to leave yep. to, for Britain to leave the European Union. We've had the election of Donald Trump in the United States. Yep. And we've had um, a very real possibility in the French elections of the National Front winning yep. um, their election. What direction are Western democracies heading and where would you put the situation in Italy on the scale of the previous events that I just mentioned? Right. Well, Western liberal democracies is in trouble. Um, the old order of um, trade, uh, transatlantic alliances, um, and liberal democracy have all taken blows over the last six months. Brexit was the first blow. It was a great surprise to the establishment. It was the rise of a white working class who felt that they hadn't won through uh, globalization and Europeanization and voted for protectionism, voted for nationalism against cosmopolitanism. Same pretty much with the Donald Trump election. It was the vote of people who felt that they'd lost out from uh, trade and from all these uh, alliances that America had um, developed over the last 40 or 50 years. Do you think the referendum will pass? No, I think the referendum will fail. I don't think it will fail by much, uh, but it will fail. But there again, I was wrong about the Brexit vote. I was wrong about the Trump <laughs> vote. So I don't bet on anything so I say. So were we all. Right. Well, Professor, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. The death of former Cuban President Fidel Castro is generating talk about the future of relations between the U.S. and the island nation. President-elect Donald Trump says he'll scrap the deal President Obama struck with Cuba that restored dip diplomatic relations unless Cuba frees political prisoners and gives its people political freedom. Talking about international correspondent Tom Austin is here to tell us what the state is of U.S.-Cuban relations and how things could change moving forward. Thanks, Alex. Yesterday, hundreds of Cuban exiles in Miami gathered Wednesday to protest Fidel Castro's regime and to demand freedom for the Cuban people. And JetBlue Flight 337 took off for Cuba, the first U.S. commercial flight to do so in more than a half century. U.S. carriers are expected to churn out over 100 flights daily in due time. This comes just under two years after President Obama and Cuban President Raul Castro announced that the U.S. and Cuba would restore full diplomatic ties. Now, restrictions on travel for U.S. citizens were included in the deal, but only to the extent that Americans have an excuse. There are 12 categories of authorized travel, uh, which include family visits, journalistic activities, uh, educational activities, and religious activities. Now, additionally, the deal includes economic cooperation between the two, and American travelers are to be able to use U.S. credit and debit cards. U.S. companies can invest in some small businesses, and companies can export building materials to private Cuban companies, as well as communications devices to the Cuban people. While the U.S. trade embargo of Cuba remains intact, the U.S.
U.S. has become Cuba's fifth largest trading partner, much thanks to its food and agricultural sector. The U.S. and Cuba have also started to cooperate more on security, education, health, and the environment. And now that's the state of things currently, and because they were all implemented via executive action, Trump also has the executive power to undo them, as he threatens to do with his tweets. That means closing the embassy, stopping flights, and re-implementing trade restrictions. But as we've come to understand with Trump, words are one thing and actions are another. Thanks, Tom. There have been new gains in the battle for Aleppo in Syria. Government troops recently took control of a huge swath of rebel-controlled territories, splitting resistance and isolating both rebel and Kurdish forces fighting Bashar al-Assad. This has prompted a renewed exodus of refugees fleeing the renewed fighting. Talk Boys International correspondent Elijah Shama is here with more. Elijah, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, this new territory that the rebels have lost, what specifically is it and why does it matter? Basically, we're looking at eastern Aleppo. And what really matters is that they've kind of separated Kurdish rebels from regular rebels, from the Free Syrian Army. And these are people that they kind of need each other's support to survive. There's basically a rebel enclave that has been completely sectioned off. And it matters because when you're fighting surrounded by all sides, it's generally a much harder fight. So you mentioned a couple of rebel factions there. Who's still fighting in Aleppo? And what does the, what does it, its ultimate fall mean for resistance in Syria? Right now, the Free Syrian Army is still fighting in Aleppo. You also have Kurdish groups, and you have um, kind of more extremist groups in Jabhat al-Nusra, and then we see kind of Russian airstrikes and um, and Allied airstrikes. But if Aleppo falls, that really marks the end of all major resistance from Syrians in in Syria. When we look at it, kind of. The government will control all five major cities if they control Aleppo, and they'll just face kind of sparse fighting from ISIS and sparse fighting from Kurds in the rest of the country. So the human cost of the Syrian civil war, particularly in Aleppo, has been one of the more jarring developments of the last couple of years. What's the humanitarian situation in Aleppo right now? Can they get aid there? What's going on there? The government's recently opened up a road called Castello Road to try and get aid in. The UN is still not cons is still concerned that that is not nearly enough. The French foreign minister recent, recently called uh, a UN Security Council meeting on the state of Aleppo. But 20,000 people have fled the city since Wednesday, and it's not looking like that number is going to go down anytime soon. So I just, my question is, with if this ultimately ends in the Syrian government regains control basically over all of Syria, mm -hmm. what does that mean for the Syrian people? I think we'd see an authoritarian regime that was much harsher than it was when it was intact, and that's saying something, because the Syrian regime was known to be particularly brutal in cracking down on dissent. We'd see kind of really the death of the Arab Spring. And we've already kind of seen it fail in Egypt. We've seen kind of it not play out the way people wanted it to. This would really be the nail in the coffin. Well, Elijah Shama, thank you for joining us. Coming up after the break, votes are being recounted in the North Carolina governor's race. We will have the latest. Adventure can be found anywhere, but the best place to start is in the forest. I spy something beginning with S. Snow? No. Snow-covered trees? Nothing to do with snow. Head outside to discover incredible animals <laughs> and beautiful plants that come together to create an unforgettable adventure. Wow. So grab your loved ones. Don't even. And explore a world of possibilities. Come on, this way. Visit discovertheforest.org to find the closest forest or park to you. The recounts in the presidential election aren't the only recounts happening around the country. Democratic candidate Roy Cooper claimed victory against Republican incumbent Pat McCrory the night of the North Carolina governor's election. The next morning, however, the governor told his supporters that the race was not over. Despite the fact that Cooper's lead is growing as more votes are verified, McCrory has been challenging results at every turn. 
Here to break down these claims a little further is Talking Points contributor and North Carolinian, Joey Lino. Joey, thank you for joining us. Alex, thanks for having so me. So how, by what authority has McCrory been able to continue this uh, just prolong the election for three weeks. Uh, McCrory has been um, asserting that, uh, particularly in Durham County, there has been um, malfunctioning with voting machines and just improper voting procedures, saying that dead people have been voting or that just making claims of voter fraud. And um, we're really not really finding these. The um, particular Durham County is where mm -hmm. they're particularly focused um, because they had a electronic malfunction with voting machines on the night of the election and it looked like McCrory was ahead for most of the night and then mm -hmm. right at the end of the night when those votes came in from Durham it pushed Cooper over the edge so a lot of Republicans are feeling almost cheated right at how that so changes the we're edge. three weeks into um, a recount how long conceivably could this go on so every county all 100 counties in North Carolina were supposed to have their results verified by Tuesday however Tuesday or, or excuse me by yesterday however yesterday uh, the North Carolina State Board of Elections granted a recount to McCrory for Durham counties for some 94,000 votes in Durham County however um, McCrory's campaign has said that if the they find that the results are similar mm -hmm. after recounting Durham, their campaign will concede the election. So if, if nothing changes, McCrory would be the first North Carolina governor ever to lose re-election. It's really hard to lose re-election in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Why is McCrory looking like he could get this ignoble distinction? Uh, it's actually really interesting because Republicans did very well on November 8th in North Carolina, but Pat McCrory earlier this year signed into law HB2 in North Carolina. The bathroom bill. The bathroom bill. And the blowback from that was huge. He took an approval rating hit as soon as he signed that bill, and he just really hasn't recovered from it. And uh, so assuming Roy Cooper takes over, North Carolina, I believe, still has a Republican House, Republican mm -hmm. State Senate. Uh, what sort of changes do you think you could see in North Carolina with a Democratic governor? Um, honestly, I really, as a Democrat, I really don't know. But um, I would like to see the state just, I, I would like to see Democrats' views represented a little more in the state mm -hmm. because... It has had Republican control, but the state's honestly split 50-50 demographically, politically, and right. so it's an interesting dynamic to see with the state can fully controlled. It's by certainly going to be a state to watch in the years ahead. Joey, thank you for joining us. Lastly, there was a tweet sent earlier this week by the president-elect that caught my attention. You probably know what I'm referring to. It was when he proposed that those who burned the American flag be jailed or lose their citizenship. In one tweet, Donald Trump trampled on two constitutional amendments. The First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. The government cannot punish someone for political speech, even if that speech is something as patently offensive as burning the American flag. And the Supreme Court has repeatedly upheld this ideal. The Fourteenth Amendment says, no state shall abridge the privileges and immunities of the citizens of the United States. That means your citizenship cannot be revoked, much less revoked for exercising your First Amendment rights. Beyond the Constitution, let's be clear about what he is suggesting, because he He's suggesting that because he and many others find flag burning offensive, he wants to outlaw it. He's proposed outlawing it. He's proposed outlawing a form of dissent and protest against the government. While the American government has made the mistake of doing that in the past, particularly during World War I and during the Red Scare, it is no less a shameful retreat from the values that the framers put in to this document and the millions of Americans bled and died for. I hope this was a mere slip of the mind by President-elect Trump and that he upholds his oaths of office to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. That's all the time we have for tonight. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure to check out all of our online content on CitrusTV.com, including our full interview with Dr. Morgan. For Talking Points, I'm Alex Amico. Good night, Syracuse.